uh, before the Depression, my family moved to the Peace River country, where we settled on a quarter section of land called a homestead. For the big sum of ten dollars, we had to break or plow ten acres of land every year for three years before the land belonged to us. This was real pioneering days, and the road into the area, which was only a trail, cut out by the surveyors in 1911, called the Edson Trail, and traveled by covered wagons. Many used the trail by bringing their cattle and horses and furniture, and having to cross four rivers, Athabasca, Simonette, Little Smoky, and Big Smoky. Some of the pioneers took six weeks to make the journey of 400 miles. Rivers were crossed on a raft in summer and over the ice in winter. We built our log abode and started to grub and break and seed the grain. This was a, a real tough time, almost a little depression. We went to a one-room log school with eight grades. Each row equaled a grade. We rode to school sometimes four on one horse, and it was sixty below in the winter, and some came by dog sled. Our little village increased in size with a family of six to ten people on every quarter section. Now all through the twenties we were struggling, but the community spirit kept us alive. Everyone sees the depression as a disaster. Were there any activities to keep your mind off of it? Uh, for entertainment, we had rodeos in the summertime. This was a great time of roping, riding, and racing. Roman riding and chuck wagon races. Once in three or four months, we enjoyed a picture show of cowboys and Indians and Charlie Chaplin. We had great ludicrous suppers along with the old time dances. In the 20s and 30s, we were entertained by the Chautauqua. They set up their tent in the small towns, three days, and in the bigger towns, it was seven days. We had elocutionists, barber shop quartets, Russian Cossacks, singers, plays, orchestras, opera singers, bell ringers, and choirs. Wonderful music for the farmers. Chautauqua started in the early 1900s in Canada from 1917 to 1935. Now in the winter we had high ski scaffolds erected and also had hockey. 1928 and 29 were good years, but then the times changed. Farmers in the 30s left home because they couldn't grow crops or because they couldn't sell the wheat they grew. The Depression cost Canada more than a billion dollars in relief. There was no welfare. No one has ever reckoned its spiritual price. In your opinion, what were some of the most disastrous periods during the Depression? Uh, some of the natural disasters were drought, dust, storms, grasshoppers, hail, heat, and the killing frost. The dust was like sand dunes. You could walk over the fences. The trains could not run on the track. Grasshoppers were a slippery mess on the rails. The heat was unbearable. Water was scarce. Cattle and horses were dying. You ask, how did we eat? Remember we had eggs. They sold for two cents a dozen. We could butcher a steer and we would pick and can wild raspberries, wild blueberries, wild strawberries, and wild cranberries. And last but not least, Saskatoon, our main dairy. We would also have a vegetable garden. Where did the Depression take you? In 1934, the tough times were gaining on us. Russian thistles spread its tentacles across the hayfields. 
choking out the young wheat. No price for the cattle and no price for the hogs. We decided to leave. We loaded our 1927 Rio truck with all our belongings and started out for the coast for Vancouver. There were 11 of us in the truck, and it reminded me of The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. It took us seven days to travel 400 miles to Edmonton. Mud, mud, and more mud. Slave Lake was a bad place to motor. It took us another seven days to get to Vancouver. We hillbillies crossed over the old Westminster Bridge, built in 1904. We had to wait for a a green light, because two trucks could not pass on the bridge. We went to Sapperton, put up our 10 by 12 tent, and stayed for two weeks. I went to my first mayday. Kathleen Finlayson was the May Queen, and I went to the show at the Edison Theater for 10 cents. Then we were conned into looking for gold up in a mountain a few miles from Vernon. During the tough times, in 1934, what did you do to support yourself? The Depression was getting ugly, and we were broke. The gold deal was a fizzle, and we made nothing. Next year, we headed back to New Westminster in our truck. We got a goat in, Ver in Vernon, which kept us alive, and also picked tomatoes for 50, 15 cents an hour, and we picked apples for four cents a box. Uh, in Vancouver, my brothers used to go and sing in the restaurants on Cordova Street, a court barbershop quartet. Mm, we got many free meals and a big help to survive. The meals on Cordova Street and Water Street were 15 cents. Their menu was, uh, oh, very good menu. Menu it was a soup, main meal, dessert, and three heaping slices of bread, white, brown, and raisin. This was 1935, and Vancouver was seething with unemployment. The boys were marching up and down the streets. They were tin canning for money. They were being picked up and sent to the labor camps. There were 64 camps in B.C., and they were paid 20 cents a day. The drought drove people off their farms and sent them wandering back and forth across Canada, looking for jobs. They came to Vancouver because it was warmer, and you could get a meal if you had a little money, ten cents. The, uh, the Canadian federal system had been severely shaken by the big market crash of 29. Steve Brody, one of the leaders of the men who struck the post office and the hundreds like him who were dropping like flies from the freights in the Vancouver yards, had a maxim, it's stupid to be hungry and cold at the same time. It was this maxim that caused the country to tip on end, sliding its jobless to the city at the end of the line. Vancouver, which entered the 30s, a city of 246,000, was to suffer a decade of continuous violence that approached revolution, flirt with communism, and emerge as Canada's most scared, scarred depression town. In 1938, Teddy Lyons was running his open-air observation streetcar. The youngsters who worked in the tar paper shacks under the bridges were smoking turrets, dating girls with long hair, necking on the moonlight, cruise to Bowen Island and dancing at the Alexander Ballroom while the Rhythm Ramblers played We're in the Money and Smile Darn Your Smile. There were band concerts at Stanley Park, ferry rides to North Shore, Boot Gibson at the movies, Major Bowes at the Beacon, Amos and Andy on radio, Father Divine and Clem Davies, and Reverend Rodden. He was railing against sin and whiskey. But not all this could shut out the protests of the single transient unemployed. In the spring of 1935, the longshoremen went on strike, also a strike in the relief camps. This aggravated the situation, and 60 were injured. 
The unemployed continue to meet, march, tie up traffic, fight with police, collect their Moscow gold in the tin cans and be tossed into the jails. Mayor McGeer read the riot act and Harold Winch averted a riot. The union doled out 30 cents a day to each member but had to be available for the marches. They struck at Hotel Georgia, the art gallery, and the post office. Brody occupied the post office with 1,000 men. The public for the 30-day duration of the sit-down threaded its way and threw and over the bodies. On June the 19th, the police lobbed in a Lake Erie jumper. The post office was cleared in 10 minutes. A wave of frantic, screaming, crying humanity spilled into the street to be clubbed by Mounties and by city police until the pavement of Granville and Hastings was spattered with blood. Four Mounties beat Brody, last man out of the building. When Brody got up, he was beaten again with a rubber hose. Then a wild riot ensued. Thirty-nine were injured, $30,000 damage and 22 arrested. Winch stopped 10,000 from storming the police station. The unemployed were given emergency relief and jobs in the name of public works. Was there any relief or welfare to help you during the tough times? There was no welfare and no few food banks. The men marched 500 in a group. They marched in and out of department stores. They started for Ottawa on the rails, but were stopped at Regina. How long did people expect the Depression to last? No one expected the Depression to last for 10 years, 29 to 39. In 1936, they figured that the drought was over, but it raged worse than ever. The first of the grasshopper plagues hit the Red River Valley in 1932, the worst swarm in 50 years. The worst swarm of the Depression which hit Regina on August 11th, 1938, was clouds of hoppers blotted out the sun and blanketed buildings and streets. When a rainstorm washed them into sewers, they, they plugged the intakes and the streets were flooded. The hoppers even ate the clothes that were hanging on the line. When the chickens ate the grasshoppers, and they ate them by the thousands, you couldn't eat the chickens, and you couldn't eat the eggs. You must remember there was very little money. Two free press reporters stopped at a gas station and had the hoppers cleaned from their radiator. After getting some gas, they gave the attendant ten dollars and drove off. The attendant ran after them and shouted, Don't give me ten dollars. Nobody can change ten dollars. They also stopped at a farmhouse. The lady invited them for lunch. They washed their hands and threw the water on the ground. The little girl ran into the house and shouted, Mommy, they threw the water away. When you washed and threw the water, you, you threw the water in a barrel and used it for washing clothes. How did the Depression end? It wasn't until 1939 that the prairies yielded their first good crop in 11 years. I got a job for 25 cents an hour, went overseas in 42. Oh, remember that goat we had in Vernon? Well, we brought it with us in the truck to Westminster and tethered it on an empty lot on 8th Street and 3rd Avenue. I milked it morning and evening and we finally sold it to the goat farm on Cumberland between 8th and 10th. Now I hope that you will remember a few of the events that I have experienced, and don't forget that when I had 35 cents, I could have a good meal for 10 cents, go to the movie and vaudeville for 10 cents, and go to the 5 and 10 store and buy a lot of things for 15 cents. The depression was terrible. The land had reached a point where it had been worked and worked and harrowed and plowed so much that it was very fine. There was nothing to hold it, so it just picked up and blew across the countryside. You looked out, see 
the great cloud of dust coming, and then you're you're in it, and you can hardly see twenty feet ahead. The dust gets into your nose and mouth, and drifting into the houses under the doors and windows. Dust on the floor, dust on the table, dust in the cupboard, dust in the ditch, in the dishes, and dust in the clothes. More than six thousand families in Saskatchewan loaded all their possessions on their wagons and left. Most went to the north to get away from the dust and the wind. And that was the Great Depression of the Hungry Thirty.